Welcome to It's All Your Fault on True Story FM, the one and only podcast dedicated to helping you identify and deal with the most challenging human interactions, those involving someone with a high conflict personality. I'm Megan Hunter, and I'm here with my co-host, Bill Eddy. Hi, everybody. We are the co-founders of the High Conflict Institute in San Diego, California, where we focus on training, consulting, coaching, classes, and educational programs and methods, all to do with high conflict. Today is the second episode of our new series, Five Types of People Who Can Ruin Your Life. And today's focus will be on the cruel con artist types, the antisocials. But before we start, send your questions to podcast at highconflictinstitute.com or on our website at highconflictinstitute.com slash podcast, where you'll also find all the show notes and links. Give us a like or a, or a review wherever you listen to podcasts. All right, Bill. So last week we talked about, uh, in the first episode, we talked about the basics of the high conflict personality, which uh, we identified as about 10% of the population. And today we're going to talk about the first of the five types, the cruel con artist type, the antisocial personality. And uh, we're going to talk about what it is, what here's the problem, right? And here's what it looks like. And then what can we do about it? What can be done? So let's talk then. Let's start with the problem. You start the book, the chapter on antisocials in this book with this. One of the most charming and therefore incredibly dangerous high conflict personality types is the sociopath. While typically thought of as a criminal personality, the majority of sociopaths are not in prison and you may run into them in everyday life. But their behavior is antisocial, against society's standards of social behavior and laws, and can be extremely harmful. So the con artists, you know, it strikes me, I mean, we all hear about con artists, Bill, but what kind of s- struck me with how you titled this chapter is the use of the word cruel. And it's what we hear a lot when when we talk about this this personality type and how they impact other people. So there's the con artist part, there's the cruel part. So it's kind of confusing, right? Yeah, it's, they really, there's a wide range of this personality, but some of the themes that they really lack the empathy that most people have that help us kind of watch out for each other and not try to hurt each other. But they lack the empathy. They lack remorse. They don't feel bad if they've hurt somebody. It just doesn't register. And it almost seems like a brain wiring issue that they just start out wired a little bit differently. And some people say in many ways, like three-year-olds, that they want what they want and they want it now and they don't care if they have to hurt somebody to get it. And you might say, what's the it that they want? And it really varies. It's often money. It's often property. Maybe it's reputation, certainly sex. A a lot of suggestions that they're more promiscuous than the average person and than other personality disorders, that they're more aggressive, that they're certainly more deceitful. That's one of the biggest characteristics, that they'll lie, and they'll lie without remorse. And unlike When we talk about narcissists who tend to exaggerate their importance and stuff, but they don't lie a lot. Antisocial really lies a lot. That's often how you notice, hey, this person lies about everything. Well, that's a hint. You may be dealing with an antisocial, which means that you may be dealing with somebody with a lot of secrets, with secret behaviors that aren't going to come out until you've made a commitment. Maybe you've gotten married, and now all that sweet charm goes away, and there's a lot of dominance going on. But before I forget it, I want to mention we're not teaching people to diagnose personality disorders. We're looking at the more practical side of patterns of high-conflict behavior, And this personality, whether it's a disorder or maybe someone just has some traits of this, can still be very difficult 
especially in close relationships, because they're so manipulative. Saying things like, hey, honey, I, I, I got to take off for the weekend. There's this really big project at work I have to do. And, and instead, they're flying to the other side of the continent to spend the weekend with their other family that you don't know anything about. And so it could be this, but there's a wide range. And some people have a little bit of this and may you may be able to manage relationships with them. But by and large, this is the most extreme, I would say, of the cluster B personality disorders, which is antisocial, histrionic, borderline, and narcissist, and what we call the high conflict personalities, which are those four plus paranoid. So this is one to be aware of and be aware that you're being deceived. And most people will be deceived at some point by someone like this. Let me mention, though, before I forget it, <laughs> is the three different terms that people confuse here. So there's antisocial personality disorder, which is primarily what we're talking about, although it doesn't have to be a disorder, may just be mild traits, but has this pattern of conning, aggressive behavior, etc. Then there's sociopath. And sociopath and antisocial personality overlap a lot. But what's interesting, antisocial personality lacks empathy, lacks remorse, whereas some sociopaths may have family families that they care about. And an example might be like the mafia. They're out there killing people and conning people, but in their family, they really do love their wife and love their kids. So someone who's a sociopath may have that just for certain people, but everybody else should watch out. Antisocial personality disorder seems more sweeping that, you know, there's really nobody that's safe, even their spouses and children, like, say, Bernie Madoff, who kept it secret from his family and destroyed his family when it finally came out that he was a conning billionaire and really had 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 a pyramid scheme of sorts. So anyway, and the last is psychopath. And that's like a quarter of antisocials and sociopaths, maybe psychopaths, which is more aggressive energy, more willingness, and perhaps pleasure out of hurting people. So it's a smaller group, maybe 1% of society, whereas antisocial and sociopaths are around 4% of society. Let me go back to the conning, um, you know, we hear about the 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 people that do have a, you know, a, a guy or a girl in every port. <laughs> <laughs> now, is that a bona fide? Absolutely. That person has, you know, some tinge of this antisocial personality. If you if you if someone's caught out in something like this or or not. And how would you tell? Well, there, there are certain categories of behavior that make me think, okay, there's antisocial traits here. Like having multiple um, families or multiple partners that they've been very secretive about. And what's interesting, again, I'll mention narcissists. Narcissists often like to have more than one relationship to keep them you know, getting the narcissistic supply that they want, but they often don't keep it a secret. They instead, they say, hey, you have to understand my needs are more than most people and I have to have this. Whereas the antisocial may have an entire secret life. For example, I, I worked, consulted with a divorce client. She was married for six years and it wasn't until going through the divorce that she found out that her husband did not have a job. He would go to work every morning, but he didn't have a job. He was pretending to go to work every morning. And apparently where he got his money was he was somehow uh, siphoning money off her father's business. And so that's where the family money was coming from. It wasn't his job. So he conned her. Now, he wasn't a violent person. Some are violent, but many aren't violent. And in many ways was a seemingly kind person. but. It was a pretend life. He wasn't who he said he was. And she had this kind of cold feeling like there's a lot that's not there. 
So that's that's one example. So I had an acquaintance who uh, said they didn't have a job, but they would leave their home every day at the same time and drive to, you know, like 25 miles to the downtown area of the city, uh, all dressed up and come home about the same time every night. And she said she was job hunting there. But I don't know anybody else that would job hunt for eight hours a day in person, pounding the streets for a marketing executive job, right? So it's kind of interesting to to realize that the the con isn't a specific con all the time. It's just whatever suits their needs. She needed to con money from people saying, I don't have a job, when in actuality, she did have a job. And there are a whole lot of other red flags. And that's what confused me. And that's what is always the tell. And we'll talk about, here's what it looks like later. But one of the tells is confusion. And I got that from your book, Bill, It's All Your Fault. When I was p- dealing with this particular female acquaintance, and I was feeling so confused with her. And I went back and I read that antisocial chapter and ah, there it is. When you feel confused, like things just don't add up. Right. I call them the, the double life people, right? Whether it's this, this, uh, you know, lying about whether they have a job or they don't, or whether they have cancer or they don't, or whether they have this beautiful life on Facebook or Instagram with beautiful pictures and, and loving and kind toward everybody. You know, I'm praying for you. I love you. I think you're wonderful. Oh, you poor thing. Let me, you know, can I bring you a meal? All of those things. But on the flip side and in the real life, it's a whole different story. And they're cruel and they're destroying other people. So they're the double life people. Bill, on a scale of one to five, picking between these five high conflict types, antisocial, borderline, narcissistic, histrionic, and paranoid, where does the antisocial rank in terms of of their impact on others? I would say it depends on the individual because you could have someone say with borderline personality disorder who is so jealous that they kill their lover or their their partner's boyfriend or girlfriend. But overall, in general, the antisocial is is generally the more difficult and more damaging, partly because it's such a psychological deception. And people just feel so devastated when they find out that this isn't at all the person I thought this was. Like after getting married and then you find out, you know, you've got this very aggressive, domineering kind of partner who was sweet and loving up to that point. That's why we say to wait a year before you commit to get married, have a child, buy a house, all of that, because they can cover up this stuff for quite a while, but usually not a whole year. So that's, you know, I'd say it's the worst, but I also, it's more generally the worst. And I want to mention briefly, of course, in addition to my own books, there's a book I read recently called Sociopath, and it's about a woman who really talks about growing up, realizing she was different, that she lacked empathy for people, that she enjoyed stealing from people. She enjoyed breaking into people's houses, usually thinking that they're not home. And yet she set rules for herself. And she said, I'm not allowed to hurt anybody. I can never let myself hurt anybody. So she limited her sociopathic behavior to breaking into houses and stealing things, but not hurting anybody. She also seems to have a good relationship with a man who became her husband. And that's why I wanted to mention that that sociopaths may be able to have empathy for somebody, even though they don't have empathy for most people. So there's a wide range And that's why it's important to be aware of this, but not be judgmental, but be protective and don't let people into your life too close who may have these very deceptive personalities. Absolutely. So that's an interesting, you know, premise in that book that she was able to have that level of insight. And it makes me think about someone I had a conversation with recently who's adult child has been diagnosed now with autism spectrum disorder. 
And it's made uh, the parent that I was talking to wonder if they also have this autism spectrum disorder. And one of the the issues is just not really feeling something when someone's dying, let's say, right? I mean, having empathy, like being able to handle it. And even last night I was watching the 602 Lost in Phoenix channel on YouTube. It's a guy that that uh, interviews homeless people in Phoenix. It's just, it's so tragic. And uh, there's one gal that he's been following lately that's very close to death. You know, she's like down to 75 pounds and the drug use is just horrible. And so his followers were messaging him saying, hey, how is your mental health? Are you doing okay? And he said, look, I'm one of those people that has a personality that can just compartmentalize. You know, I can go and talk to them and I really, I can say, okay, this is their life. This is not my life. I'm going to do what I can to help, but I'm not, I don't let it affect me. So is that, I guess the, the, the question there is, I, I don't want to anyone to think that just because you don't have maybe strong emotions of, of empathy or thoughts of feelings of empathy, is that the right way to say it? Or that you can handle things differently it doesn't mean you have antisocial personality, right? You could be maybe somewhere on another spectrum. And, but it doesn't mean you have, you know, you're a sociopath or you could just be able to be very good at compartmentalizing. I, I don't know. I mean, what do you think about that? I think a lot with antisocial and sociopath is it's about being against the rules of society. You're willing to harm people. You're okay breaking the law and you're good at deceiving people so that you can either harm them or get away with things that benefit with you. So I think of the the lack of feeling uh, or lack of empathy itself may be situational. I know sometimes if someone's dying, you would think you feel empathy for them. But what if that's someone who's been hurting you or like an abusive spouse who gets cancer and stuff? And It's hard to have empathy because you're not going to get hit anymore if this person is sick or if they're dying. So it's it's more to do with those kind of against society characteristics and willingness to harm other people. A lack of empathy, I don't feel sad for them, is different from, hey, I'm willing to hurt them to get what I want. Yeah. So if it's a, if it's a lack of empathy or a lack, you know, then it's, it's, uh, it's got to have the plus, right? <laughs> plus the cruel side or plus I want to harm someone. Plus I want to steal from some, I, I want to hurt someone. Right. And there's the lack of remorse. Yes. And let me add, if you're concerned about yourself, go to a counselor and talk about what your concerns are. Because what's interesting is the high conflict personalities are busy blaming everybody else, and they don't go to counselors unless they want to manipulate them to get a letter for court or something like that. They don't seek to change or work on themselves. People who are reflecting on themselves and have concerns on themselves usually don't have a personality disorder because there's 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 that's a more fixed and less self-aware condition you know and same with like antisocials uh there's a lot of programs out and i think about the uh, program dexter dexter's this guy he's you know he works with the police force but on the side he tends to murder people that he thinks need to be eliminated from society take out the trash <laughs> yeah right right <laughs> Or Tony Soprano, you know, in The Sopranos. But the thing that's not real is those people are busy reflecting on themselves in those TV shows, and that's not real. They're doing what just fits who they are. They're not even really thinking much about it in that kind of self-reflective way. They're looking at how they can run their next scam or get their next person. So that's important for people to know. There isn't this self-reflection. That's a piece that's missing. And it's really missing for all of the personality disorders and all of the high-conflict personalities. They're totally thinking, how can I do my next thing, rather than, gee, should I have really done that? They don't have that kind of reflection. So let's talk a couple of minutes. Let's switch into the, uh, from, you know, this is the problem, um, into the 
how do we identify this? Here's what it looks like, right? So, you know, I like to say when I think about this, that we kind of think that the antisocial personality with the word cruel attached to it, right? That they're going to show up with an ax <laughs> or with a sign that says, I'm going to be really make your life hell. I mean, you've already mentioned that they often present with charm, but do they always present with charm? Because I, the the female I was talking about a few minutes ago, she would, did not present with, with charm. She was very kind of a neutral affect and kind of had an odd vibe about her. But then everything after that was, you know, ticked all the boxes of this personality pattern. There's some, there's variation. Because generally it's an anti-society kind of thing, is they may come on with charm. And by the way, charm itself isn't necessarily a bad thing. There's people who are very charming, and it's true. But it's more common with these folks that they're very charming. And I, I would suggest that antisocials and narcissists are the most charming people in the world. So it's a warning sign. But it's like a yellow light. It's not a red light. You want to check it out and see what's really going on. But the biggest thing with, I think, with antisocial is don't pay attention to what they look like and what they say, because they can look and say like everybody else, is do a background check. Find out who knows this person. What do they know about this person? Does this person have any relatives that I can talk to? So if you're dating or if you're hiring, um, those kinds of things, or going to hire someone to do some work on your house, those kinds of things, you want to get some verification that they are who they say they are. And I'll just give a quick example with that. In my very first book for legal professionals, High Conflict People and Legal Disputes, I included a guy who went to prison for uh, insider trading on Wall Street. And I put his name in there. His first name was Jeffrey. I put his whole name in there. Well, about five years after that, I get an email from a woman saying, I just read your book and I can't believe, but that's the same guy that I gave $10,000 to to fix a retaining wall in front of my house, and I never saw him again. I wish I had read your book before because he used his real name. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. So there's the, you know, bat right back to they lie when they know they can get caught. Right? Yes, because they can talk people out of it because their facial expressions, tone of voice, body language, they can manipulate and that's why cross-examination in court with antisocials is a risky thing because they often can con people. And I'm not saying it particularly fits this person, but do you remember the bloody glove? Oh. You know, <laughs> yes. the bloody glove that wouldn't, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Well, that's the kind of con that these con artists do. And I'm not saying, you know, OJ was a con or was antisocial, but I'm saying that's the kind of behavior that antisocials will do in court, and they win sometimes because they're so good at conning. So you've, you've got to check that out. And one other thing I want to mention is your gut feelings sometimes are the ones that say, hey, something's out of sync here. The words are perfect, but it just doesn't feel right. It's kind of cold you know, disconnected. That's it. That's what I was experiencing from this person. It was a little bit of a, cold, a frost, right? And disconnected. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Or, uh, or a danger feeling like, ooh, you know, this person could hurt me if nobody else was around. Yeah. Okay. And another th thing, and we'll take a break right after this, is when we have over empathy for someone, right? Like, I want to do more for this person. I want to, I'm going to give more, uh, you know, so they either have cancer or grandpa's in a wheelchair and needs a wheelchair. And, that's, you know, I've, I've got a, a situation right now I'm working with where 
there's a wheelchair at issue <laughs> for someone in a, a third world country uh, who need this, this fellow needs a wheelchair. And I tell you what, the person here in the U.S. has managed to buy that wheelchair or maybe buy 50 wheelchairs with the amount of money that's been raised individually from people without them knowing that there's 49 other wheelchairs already been purchased <laughs> Not really, but um, it's it's all a con, and and the same individual has been caught on camera doing something that they said they didn't do, and with the video, this is the thing about about the antisocial type is with video proof presented to their face, absolutely will not confess to it. Right, that, right. That didn't happen. I didn't. Uh, that's not me. That I don't know how that could be. You know, I don't and know then what what's happened. That to your brain? It makes your brain go. Is there something wrong with me? Am I missing something? What? I better watch that video again. So if you have those thoughts, there's your clue. Right? There's get your antenna up. It's just not. It, you're not dealing with something that you think you are. And that person's going to go and charm and all that. So, okay, with that, let's take a quick break. We'll come back and talk about the what you can do. So, Bill, let's talk about, you know, what you can do. Um, you've created the CARS method of handling high conflict. It's like the overarching principles. It's the way you you handle high conflict people in your interactions with them and, and kind of get those sorted. But is there one that you're going to use more than others with the antisocial personality? Two things. One is CARS is connecting analyzing, responding, and setting limits. And with connecting, we tend to use ear statements, empathy, attention, and respect. Antisocials really like respect. So if you sprinkle your conversation, you know, I was consulting once with a celebrity whose ex-husband she believed might be antisocial. And I said, then sprinkle your conversations with the word respect. I respect you. I respect your relationship with our child. I respect your efforts. And this is that. And I hope you'll respect mine. That may calm an antisocial person. Like I said, they're not all violent. They're not all involved in criminal behavior, but they may have a secret life. You know, they may be connecting with, you know, phone sex or escorts or something. And that's where looking up the records, credit card records of a partner. I've had several people I've consulted with who were shocked to find what their partner was spending money on. Gambling, big gambling debts and such. So respect is a word that, that helps manage them. But in many ways, it's setting limits and imposing consequences, that that's really what's going to happen. And that's what employers need to think about earlier. Employers tolerate bad behavior longer than they should if it's a pattern of bad behavior. They say, look, you give one chance, but not five chances, things like that. And one thing I want to quickly say is not all people with a criminal record or prison record are antisocial. And there's some businesses that hire people out of prison to give them a second chance in life who do well. So this is tricky stuff, and you should get consultation and not jump to conclusions. But on the other hand, be cautious. So Part of setting limits and imposing consequences is taking your time to get to know somebody. Because I can't tell you there's one single sign that will tell you, oh, this is an antisocial person who will abuse you if you marry them. I can't, I can't tell you that because we don't know there's one sign. But the general thing, get some background, take your time. Same with whenever you're going to give somebody $10,000 to work on your house, do a good background check. Google them. So many people are out there on Google and they have a history, those kinds of things. But you, you may need to set limits. And in relationships and marriages, if you don't go to counseling with me, I'm, I'm going to have to separate and think about our relationship, things like that. You know, the, the old phrase, trust, 
but verify comes to mind. And I think with this, it's don't trust and verify, right? Right. So one last question, and then we'll wrap this up, is the problem with one of the many problems with the con artist is so many people believe them and they have no problem destroying you and your relationship or your your reputation in a community in a family in a business in the media right they will they they just don't stop if they ha- if you are their target of blame they want to destroy you they probably say bad things about you to other people and bad mouth you most people will believe them because the con is so strong. So if you're the person that's having your reputation destroyed, you're being bad-mouthed, and people don't know what to do um, or d- just don't know who to believe, do you say, do you try to convince someone that this person is conning them? You want to say, first of all, hey, look, whenever someone's making strong, severe accusations about something, you need to have three theories One is it might be true. The second is it might not be true at all. It completely false. And the person saying these things is making false statements and acting badly. The third is maybe both people are acting badly. Well, in this case, that person's making false allegations against me. And you have to look at that serious possibility. And that's what I tell people if they're going to court. Because antisocials are good at persuading judges, good at persuading communities, good at persuading employers that you're a terrible person and that they're a victim of you. So that they're playing the victim is a common theme for antisocials, and it works. They will turn people against you who will hate you without knowing you. And that's where this comes from. So keep your eyes open. Or even if they do know you, it plants a seed of doubt in their mind, and they start then creating their own story or their own na- narrative without without checking it out. So one last question for you, Bill. If you had one piece of advice or wisdom for someone who understands just through listening to this episode that wow, there's somebody close in my life who this really marks the spot, (laughs) hits the spot. What would that piece of wisdom be? I know that's a big question, broad one. Get consultation, talk to a therapist who may understand what's going on, talk to a lawyer who may understand. So if most therapists, whether they're, you know, a master's level counselor, PhD in psychology, PsyD, do they identify and recognize this antisocial personality. In case in point, this past weekend, I was I was listening to someone's uh, divorce story. And uh, this person had gone to a therapist and uh, the therapist said, oh, this person has extreme narcissistic personality. And I'm listening to this and I'm going, th- listening to the whole story. And I'm thinking that just doesn't sound so narcissistic. It sounds a lot more antisocial to me. Not that I was diagnosing or, you know, anything, but, you know, just looking at the patterns of behavior, you know, this is someone who punched the, the ex-wife's new husband in front of 200 people at a party, just walked past him and smacked him, knocked him out. And there are a whole variety of other things. So my, I, I guess the concern is, does the therapist have this kind of, of training, uh, all therapists? And if so, uh, I mean, how do you tell? How do you tell if someone does? And if if you're told that there's something, uh, what you're dealing with is maybe something different than this, is that going to harm you potentially? Or can you just use the same skills? Yeah. So many therapists don't understand this personality and get conned by this personality as well, like in couples therapy. So you want someone who knows something about this, either in your community or, I mean, consult with us. <laughs> yeah. That's always yeah. an option. We we do a lot of consultation, 30 minutes, 60 minute people trying to figure out what's happening to them. Speaking of which, I think you have a consultation right now, Bill. <laughs> yes, I <laughs> so need to do that. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thanks for listening today. Next week, we're going to talk about the third episode, um, the borderline personality types in this series. In the meantime, send your questions to podcast at highconflictinstitute.com or submit them to highconflictinstitute.com slash podcast. Until next time, keep learning and practicing the skills. Um, and while we all try to keep the conflict small, and try to find the missing piece. It's All Your Fault is a production of True Story FM. Engineering by Andy Nelson. Music by Wolf Samuels, John Coggins, and Ziv Moran. Find the show, show notes, and transcripts at truestory.fm or highconflictinstitute.com slash podcast. If your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, please consider doing that for our show. (laughs) 